Has anyone ever pointed out something that you did that was wrong? And you responded by saying, yes, that's true, but you know, what about what you did to me? What about that time that you, you, know, you did this and that to me? Now, sometimes my wife and I will, will get into uh, you know, some discussions about something heated or, or she'll, call me, she'll call me out on something that I did that was wrong. She'll say, you know, you never should have said that. Uh, you never should have did that, done that. And what I would do is I would just start talking about someone else. So I would say, but you know, that person, that person was way worse than me. You know, don't you remember what that person did? Uh, or I'll say, you know, don't you remember what that person said? And I'll try to redirect the conversation. Now, I don't know if you all are following the elections in America, but uh, in America right now, it's uh, two days until uh, the election. So we're either going to have a President Trump or a President Clinton. Right? Those are our two options right now. And if you've been following the news or, or watching some of the coverage, you'll see something very interesting about the way that this election is going. See, when Clinton says, Trump, he is so disrespectful to women. You know, Trump is terrible to women. What does Trump say? Trump says, yes, sometimes I do bad things, but, you know, Hillary Clinton's husband did terrible things to women, and Hillary Clinton did this and this, and she supported her husband, and she was just as bad to women. Or when Trump says about Clinton, Trump will say, you know, Clinton, she's terrible. Hillary Clinton, she is so corrupt. She is a terrible politician, a corrupt politician. Then what does Hillary say? Hillary says, yes, I made some mistakes, but remember when Trump did this? Remember when Trump did that? Remember when he caused this scandal? If you've watched the elections, you'll, you'll see this dynamic play. Every time one side says this or that about the other side, they turn around and then they say something else about the other side. And we all do this, right? We've all been in that place where we say, yes, but, but that person is worse, right? Or yes, but, don't you remember you did that to me? Don't you remember the time that you said this to me? Now, why, why do we do this? Why do we do this? Uh, you know, we see it in politics, uh, we see it in marriages, we see it in friendships, we see it at our workplaces. We do this because no one likes to feel like they're wrong. No one likes to see their wrongdoings pointed out. And especially if the issue is something very important to us, right? we feel very uncomfortable. We, we don't want that light to be shining on us. So what do we do? We try to change the focus, right? or we change the conversation. Let's talk about something else. So you know, none of us like the spotlight. So we're always trying to shift the blame, always trying to move it somewhere else. You know, what about this or what about that? Now we saw this the very beginning with Adam and Eve. God said, what happened? What happened? Did you eat the fruit? And what did Adam and Eve say after they disobeyed God? They said, the snake made me do it. Or he made me do it, she made me do it. Or they said, God, it's because you made the snake. It's the, the snake that you made or the fruit. You know, they, they, they blamed everyone but themselves. They said, it was this person's fault, it was this guy's fault, it was your fault. This is what we've been doing since the beginning of time. Now, there are two things that we're trying to do every time this happens. There are two things. One, we're trying to make our sin not look so bad. So when we compare it to others, we say, Yes, I sinned, but remember that person who sinned way more than me, right? So we try to minimize our sin by pointing out someone else, comparing with someone else. Or what we're doing is we try to minimize responsibility for our sin. 
So we say, it wasn't really my fault, you know, it was because of this person, or it was because of this circumstance, or it was because, you know, whatever, this and this happened, therefore, you know, I didn't really have a choice but to, to do this. But I want you to see something, because this leads to a very serious problem. Uh, this year, I went to the doctor to get a full body checkup. And uh, I don't know if you've done it this year. Uh, I, it was actually a long time since I've done it, because in America, uh, healthcare is very expensive. So getting a full body checkup might cost like thousands of dollars. But in Korea, it's much cheaper. So. Uh, and I decided, you know, I think it'd be great to get a full body checkup. So I went and they took x-rays, they checked my blood, and they did all sorts of different tests. And it was actually kind of fun because, you know, I was really curious, like, what are they going to say about me? Like, they checked everything, my hearing, my eyesight. So I was really curious, like, are they going to say I'm super healthy? Or what are they going to say about this or that? And I really wanted to see what my results would say. But when we got the test back, they told me something terrible. The doctor said, you eat too much. <laughs> you eat way too much. There's food in your intestines. There's still, you haven't digested the food that's still there. You're eating way too much, so you have to eat less. And then she said something even worse. She said, you eat too many spicy foods. And if you know me, I love spicy foods. I put spice on everything. I make all my food spicy. I always have spicy peppers. I have hot sauce. I love spicy food. And she said, she said, you have to stop eating spicy food. Not less. She said, you have to stop eating spicy food. And I didn't want to believe her. So then she showed me pictures of my stomach. And she said, this is what your stomach looks like. And it looked terrible. It was like red and really angry looking. So I said, OK, you know, that doesn't look good. Uh, but part of me still wondered, so how spicy is spicy? Can it be like just one pepper spicy? You know, what? No, it's not that spicy. Like American level spicy. Like Americans don't eat spicy food. So what if it's like just spicy for Americans, not Korean level spicy? Like, can I eat food like that? So I was thinking about this and I was thinking maybe it wasn't spiciness. Maybe it was stress. Maybe I just have stress. So if I just get less stressed, then I can eat spicy food. Eventually, what I did was I did take some steps to stop eating spicy food for a while. And I did get healthier, although I probably should have done a better job of not eating spicy food. But I, I did what I could, and I accepted that this is a problem. Now, what if I denied it to the very end? What if I said, you know what, um, I think you made a mistake. I think maybe you misdiagnosed me, or maybe I think the, the machine was broken. You know, check the machine again. Did the machine really say my stomach looks like that? Or maybe I could have said, you know what, but what about those people with stomach cancer? You know, they're so far off, so worse off than me. I just, I just have a little bit of indigestion, you know, not a big deal, but what about those people who, they have a serious problem. What if I said, you know, it's my wife's fault. Like, she's always feeding me spicy food. So it's not really my fault. So you know, I can't really be to blame for all of this. Now, if I had continued to act like that, deny it, shift responsibility, minimize it, then I would never have solved the problem. Our relationship with sin works the same way. Just like I can't deal with my health issue if I don't fully face it and take ownership of my sin, in the same way, if I'm not willing to fully face my sin, I can't actually ever repent of it. I can't actually ever deal with it. Now, this is a very serious problem uh, that some of us have as Christians because the only cure for sin is repentance. The only way we deal with sin is repentance. Now, we might remember that sin, uh, repentance is turning away from sin. Right? It is stopping that behavior. It's saying, I will no longer do this. And it's moving in a different direction, moving toward God. So if this is sin, you're saying, this is my sin. 
I'm going to turn completely away from it and move in a different direction. That is repentance. But you can't turn away from something that you're never even fully facing. If you don't even know what it is you're looking at, or you can't be fully invested in what it is that is a problem, you can't ever fully move away from it. So when we minimize, we say it's not that bad, or we blame, we say, you know, it's that person's fault or whatever it is, we can't really repent. And if we can't really repent, then we can't really receive forgiveness. And if you can't really receive forgiveness, then you'll never understand the beauty of God's grace or of His love. And if you never understand that, you'll also never understand why we need the cross. You'll never understand why we need the resurrection. All of that will be meaningless to you. In other words, nothing about Christianity will make sense to someone who isn't willing to fully take responsibility of his or her sin. It's a huge problem. Uh, and I think some of us, we struggle with this. In our reading today, we see a famous psalm from King David. And King David, he, you know, right before he wrote this psalm, he had committed some serious sins. He had committed adultery, and it can be argued that he was also responsible for murder. So those are some serious sins. And I'm just going to read what he said in this psalm in response to what happened. He said in verse 3, for I know my transgressions. Transgressions are sins. And my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your justice, in your judgment. Now, just to make this clear, in case you know, you're a little confused about this, when David says he only sinned against God, uh, what he means is that all sin, even sins against other people, in the end, they are sins against God because everything, even our relationships with people, when we don't do it properly, we are acting in rebellion against the way that God created us. So all sin in the end is sin against God. Now when we look at what King David said here, it's pretty clear, right? He's not making any excuses. He's not making any excuses. He could have. He could have blamed or he could have minimized. He could have said, you know what, but she did this. Right? It's because of the position she put me in. Or he could have said, you know, but it's because her husband did this. Or, you know, it's because, or well, he could have said this. He could have said, you know what, other kings do far worse things. You know, I'm a great king. But, you know, those kings from those other countries, look at what they do. They are so much worse than me. But he didn't say any of those things. Instead, he looked at his sin straight on. And he said, God, this thing right here, what I did, this was evil. There's nothing else to say about it. It was evil. There's no excuse. I'm not going to run away from it. This was evil. It was terrible. And however you want to judge me, however you want to say, you know, whatever punishment I deserve, it is justified. It is right. And I agree with whatever you bring toward me. This was David's stance. Now this is significant. David agrees with whatever justice God will bring against him. Now my question is, do we all agree with God's justice? What exactly is the seriousness of our sins? I want to just explore this a little bit. But in reality, it would only take one sin for Jesus to die on the cross. It doesn't require the sins of all of humanity. It doesn't require very, very bad people or murders or anything like that. All it takes is just one sin from one person for God to say, this is an infinite offense, and it requires the cross. Do we agree with God 
that it doesn't matter what the circumstances are, it doesn't matter if someone else sinned more than me, it doesn't matter if they've sinned in more extreme ways than me, can we really agree with God and say, my sin alone, my sin, even the sin from just one day of living, actually condemns me to die. But the penalty of just one of my sins means I don't deserve to live. That God can rightfully and justifiably kill me because it is an infinite offense against an infinite, glorious God. Do we agree with that level of justice? Do we agree that God is just when he says that? Martin Luther, maybe some of you don't know who he is, Martin Luther was a man in history who began to change the church, he reformed the church. The Catholic church, uh, there were some problems there, uh, and he went in and he said, you know, these things need to change. And one of the things he said, he said, all of life is repentance. All of life is repentance. And Pastor Tim Keller, he said this about that quote. He said, uh, Martin Luther was saying that repentance is the way that we make progress in the Christian life. Indeed, pervasive, all of life repentance is the best sign that we are growing deeply and rapidly into the character of Jesus. So have you ever wondered, why am I not changing? Why, why does it seem like I'm stuck? You know, why does Christianity seem so powerless in my life? You know, why, why is it that it seems like it should work like this, but why is it not working like that for me? You know, what difference does Christianity really make? Does it really matter? Maybe you've asked those questions, or maybe you're asking them right now. I would counter with a different question. I would say, is repentance heartbreaking, soul-bearing, utterly vulnerable, humbling repentance? the bedrock foundation of your faith? Is that the core of your faith? Is that the engine that drives your relationship with God? Or is it something else? Because everything we are and everything we do as Christians only makes sense when repentance has led us to die to ourselves. That is the only way that we will truly understand who Jesus is and who we are. This is why when Jesus came on earth and he was among the people, what was his primary message? What was the message that he declared more than anything else? It was not, I'm going to make your life better and more comfortable. It was not, I'm going to make you successful. It was not, I'm going to make you wealthy or healthier or make you feel better. It was none of those things. He said, repent. He went around, he went to these towns and he went to these people and he said, repent, repent. Repent for God's kingdom is near. Repent for God's kingdom is here. How do you know if you are truly facing your sin and repenting correctly, appropriately? One question you can ask is, why are you sorry for your sin? Why are you sorry for your sin? So let me make this distinction for you. Repentance that is self-centered, repentance that is selfish, will be more concerned with avoiding punishment uh, and somehow earning more of God's blessing. So uh, if it is a self-centered repentance, you repent because you don't want to get God's punishments. And also, you're thinking, if I repent a lot or if I repent with like, a lot of emotion or if I'm really sad about my sin, then maybe I can make up for what I did or maybe I can earn more of God's love for me. Right? I, gotta, I gotta cry when I repent. That's the way that I can really earn back what I need from God. That is self-centered repentance. But repentance that is God-centered 
will just be sorry about the sin itself. And it will be sorry because that sin caused God to be hurt and it caused other people to be hurt. That's it. So repentance that is God-centered makes no excuses uh, and understands that it is by grace. So for me personally, when I look at my own Christian walk, I know my heart is not right when I repent because I'm afraid that my sin will hurt my ministry. Do you see why that's self-centered repentance? Uh, I repent because I believe that my sin is going to hurt what I, what I love, what I want to succeed. I want my ministry to do well. So in the back of my head, I'm thinking, oh, okay, I need to repent so that this thing that I really like and I really desire will do better. It's somehow in my thoughts, I'm believing that I can make this ministry do better. I can make God bless it more by repenting a certain way. I know that my heart is right with God, but my main concern is not how it's going to affect my ministry or things that I love, but rather the sin itself. Understanding this sin by itself is wrong, and it hurt God. This is why I need to repent. Not because through it I'm going to earn something from God. Not because through it I'm going to earn more salvation. That's actually not how it works. Because, simply because it is sin and evil in the sight of God. But we need to remember something important about repentance. And that is, again, I said, some people think we need to repent to earn forgiveness, right? It, it is, we think it is through repentance that we earn the forgiveness of God. It's this give and take. Repent, deposit, and in return we get the forgiveness of God, the grace of God. Uh, and, and we think, maybe some of you have thought this, what happens if I sin and I don't get to repent and I die? Then am I going to hell? Because that sin was unforgiven. Like, is that, is that what happens? Is that, if, if I sin right now and then I suddenly die in a tragic accident, does that mean that I go straight to hell because that sin wasn't forgiven? It wasn't taken care of? Well, what I want us to remember is because of Jesus, we don't repent to earn forgiveness or earn salvation. We just receive it. Do you see that? There is a huge difference there. And many of us, we don't understand this. Because of Jesus, we don't repent to earn forgiveness. You don't deposit repentance so that forgiveness comes. Because of Jesus, because of what he did on the cross, we just receive it. We receive forgiveness. It is not an earning. Yes, we repent. I'm not saying we don't repent, but repentance is not a payment for forgiveness. Also, because of Jesus, we don't repent to avoid God's punishment. Because it's very clear in Romans, there is now no more condemnation for us as Christians because Jesus has suffered it all. Jesus has suffered for all of our sins, all the punishment for our sins. He has suffered them already. So don't ever think that I need to repent so that God won't punish me. Don't ever think that if I don't repent, if I don't do this thing, then somehow I will be punished by God. No, that's not how it works anymore. Yes, you may experience the consequences of your sin. If I, if I sin against my wife, there will be negative consequences in our relationship. Those are consequences of sin. But I will not receive punishment from God for that sin. You understand this? This is so important. So many Christians don't get this. And they live as though they were still before the cross. They live as if they're still paying the punishments for sins that they've done. You don't have to earn it back. You don't have to pay it back. There is no process where you need to earn it. It's all there. 
you receive it. So repentance is the source of our greatest sorrow, yes. There should be nothing that pains you more and breaks your heart more than when you repent before God because it is sinning and hurting the one you love more than anyone else, the one who you value more than anyone else. But at the same time, it is a source of our greatest joy because through repentance, we receive forgiveness. We receive, again, a reminder of who we are in Christ. We receive freedom. So I know it can be terrifying to face our sins sometimes without any way to justify them. Sometimes it's terrifying to look at our sin and say, you know, to, to not making excuses, to not say I will justify this, justify this or rationalize it in some way. I'm gonna blame someone else, I'm gonna shift the focus. It's terrifying to look at your sin and say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just going to look at this sin and say, God, this is evil, and I need to repent of this sin. It's terrifying. And I know many of us, we don't do it. It's terrifying. I don't do it sometimes. I run away. It's terrifying, but we need to do it. Because on the other side of that kind of true repentance, when we honestly and fully face our sin, on the other side is real freedom. Again, if you've never experienced, if you feel like you've never experienced the true power of Christianity, you need to take that first step. You need to understand what that is. Because once you do that, then you can experience the other side. Incredible freedom, incredible joy, incredible power. Freedom, grace, joy, peace, all of those things. It comes on the other side of repentance. Let's pray.